Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Such a joy to be serving God with sharing of God's word and such a joy to worship with you this morning. I love the worship time. Um, the passage that was given to me by Pastor Kurt was Philippians chapter 2, verses starting from verse 12 going up to verse 18. So these verses. And then weeks ago, I begin to prepare. So I open up my Bible to this particular passage. And then I come to verse 12, and it starts by saying, therefore. And honestly, I don't like that word, therefore. Because it's a whole lot of more work. Because now what you've got to do is, you don't study that portion, that passage. You need to study the portion that is before that as well. And if you were not here for Pastor Kurt's message last week on the previous passage of Philippians chapter 2, you need to go back to the YouTube recording. It was just splendid. He spoke about the importance of humility. Because Paul, when he writes to the Philippian church, he talks to them the importance of not only thinking about yourself, but considering others better than yourself, and considering others' interests as much as you consider your own interests as well. And the whole conversation yeah, last week was around humility. The takeaway that I had from last week's message was this. Humility is not thinking less about yourself as much as thinking about yourself less. Did you get that? Humility is not berating yourself, putting yourself down, irrespective of whatever experiences you and I have gone through, because the Bible says that we are precious in God's sight. But humility is thinking about myself less and therefore, I get to think about others. And I think about this Jesus, this God, who was so humble to submit himself to the Heavenly Father's will and become obedient even to the point of dying on the cross. And our passage starts with this Sunday, the word, therefore. Last week, Celia and I had such a wonderful experience because we had a family staying with us. And um, Ebi and his wife, Dinah. And the little son, Elijah, eight months old. And even as we spent that little time with Elijah, Celia and I started uh, coming to this, this, this clear understanding between us that we are ready to become grandparents. It was just amazing. It was just lovely, isn't it, Celia? Elijah was outstanding. So I'm going to ask Abby and uh, Dinah, can you just stand up and I'll, I'll introduce you just a little bit more. Just stand up and wave to the, to the congregation. Say hi to him. Now, Abby and Dinah are new immigrants. They've been in Canada just over a little over than a week. They're from, yeah, absolutely. They're from India. And Ebi, after doing his theological education at Asbury in the United States of America, Asbury Theological College, he served as a pastor in India. And Diana is a medical professional. She's a, she's a medical doctor uh, specializing in internal medicine. And they moved into Canada, calling Canada their home. And they are starting life all over again with so much of joy. But you and I there's, know that there's a lot of work ahead of them, don't we? Yeah, Kluber and his wife are nodding their head, saying, yes, a lot of work. So I'm going to ask you this. After the service is over, would you go over to them and give them a warm Brentview welcome? Give them a hug. I'm sure that they will love it and make them feel at home. Would you do that? Yeah, thank you so very much. How many of you, they, they, um, you know, I mean, how many of you are... Um, first generation immigrants or international students. Can I have your hands up? Okay, thank you so much. Quite a few of you. Why don't we do this? Uh, bear with me. Can you just stand up very br briefly so that we can get to see who you are, international students and first generation immigrants? Wow, look at Brentview. Amazing. Thank you so much. You may be kindly seated. Thank you so much. Now, let me ask you this question. 
How would you describe your experience as an international student or a first generation immigrant in Canada using a word or a quick phrase? How do you describe your experience as a new um, immigrant or as an international student in Canada? Beautiful. Beautiful, thank you so much. And there's also a reason why, because of the person sitting next to her, <laughs> Rashika, uh, thank you. But others? Resilient. Resilient, thank you so much. Resilient? Any other? It's hard, but it's worth it as well. Somebody out over here. Humbling. humbling. It's a very humbling experience. That's true. That's true. Any other comments? Yes. Opportunity. opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity. You're Thank safe. you. Sorry? Safe. safe. You felt safe, right? Unlike way back where, where we come from. And? There was a voice up here. So, perseverance, meaning that it's tough. I don't necessarily endure the cold weather. I need to also persevere through those snowy roads. You know what? These experiences are so very, very true. For Celia and I, we had this amazing opportunity to come to uh, Canada, but it was not always easy. We struggled. We, there were times where we were in tears and brokenhearted, wondering whether we could go back to our home country as well. One of the uh, realities that I realized personally in my life, and I'm sure it's true for Abby and Dinah as well, and even as Dinah was asking some of these questions is, I have transported my faith I brought my faith into Canada as a Christian, but how do I get to translate my faith in this context? You understand what I'm saying? And that's not always easy, because the way that I exercised my faith, the way that I lived way back in my home country was so-and-so, but I, I realized that Canada has something different to give. Calgary is a different kind of a demography altogether, and how do I get to translate my faith? And that's more or less the, the, the uh, summation of what Paul is trying to tell the Philippian church. Why? This Philippian church was a church that has been told by Paul that Caesar is not Lord, but this Jesus who humbled himself, who obeyed the Father and died on the cross and he was risen up once again, and he's given a name above every other name, that at his name, every knee on heaven, on earth, and under this earth should bow down, and at his name, every lip shall proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And that's something new. He's also been told about the fact that you're no longer citizens, of this Roman Empire, primarily you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're a citizen of heaven, says Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. And here is the church who are trying to, to grasp and put their, uh, their heads and uh, their hearts around this rea new reality of how do I serve this Jesus as Lord and how do I become a citizen of heaven and how do I be a star in a way that God wants me to be in this depraved generation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move you all to this passage now. Philippians chapter 2, permit me to read verse 12 to 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything, Paul says, without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe. And as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ, 
that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Shouldn't just bow down our heads and look to God in a brief moment of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We thank you so much because you called us in this world to work out our salvation. What that means, Lord, we are not sure. So speak to us. Let us learn from you. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to ask four quick questions. And if for the first question your response is yes, I want you to slip up your hands and keep your hands up until I ask my second question. And if the second question's response is again yes, continue to keep your hands up. But if you're saying no, you can slip it down. And the third question, if you're saying the response is again yes, you can still keep your hands up. At this time, you are permitted to lean on your neighbor so that you can get some, no, I was just kidding. <laughs> but keep your hands up until the fourth question, and if you're saying my fourth question is no, drop it down or keep your hands up. Is that okay, does that make sense? Yeah, thumbs up, yeah, that's good. So the first question is this. How many of you are parents? Good. How many of you are parents with kids going to school? Right, thank you. How many of you are parents with kids at school who help your kids with their homework? Okay, okay, right? And the fourth question is this. How many of you are parents who help your kids with their homework by doing that homework for them? <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you know what? I mean, I do not know how to proceed with my, my notes because my next point must, was, to those of you who still have your hands up, uh, please bring your hands down. I don't see any hands up here. So I'm going to really, uh, you know, be a little more spontaneous here. But I'm glad that you didn't keep up your, your, your hands up uh, because if you had, and it's justifiable and it's valid, if you are homeschooling your kid because you're not only the parent, you're also the teacher and the principal too. So you obviously you don't get caught for doing your kid's homework, right? But all of you got your hands down. Now this exercise was to study the correlation between the sensitivity of the question and how quick your hands went down. So when I said how many of you are parents and many of your hands went up, and then I ask you, how many of you are parents having, uh, uh, your, uh, having uh, uh, your kids uh, still going to school? Uh, some of your hands went down, but it took some time. Because unconsciously, in your mind, you had those images of kids scrambling with school bags and lunch boxes, and how they had to rush boarding school buses, and if you miss the bus, you had to drive behind the bus, and you overtake it, and you've done all that? Right, and then uh, you know the images of school building, but now you're saying all that is behind me, I have control over my life again, and my life is good. And the third question, when I ask you, how many of you are parents who help kids with their homework? Some of your hands went down, but this time again it went down rather slowly because you took a deep breath and a long sigh and said, Ha, ah, my kid has grown up, I don't have to help my kid or my child do his or her homework. So you're pretty, uh, you know, excited about it. But the quickest of all hands down, pun intended, quickest of all hands down was when I asked you, how many of you do your kid's homework? And I could see that most of your hand, except one hand here, that went zoop like that, you, you let gravity work for you. 
your hands went down so very, very, very quick. And all of you who still do your kids' homework, I'm proud of you. I'm not sure if the Calgary Education Board is happy with you, but I'm proud of you. The reason is because I need to confess I did not help my kids do their homework. Why? Because I did not know the subject matter, even if it was fourth grade lessons. And if you did your kids' homework, I'm so proud of you because it only tells me you're a subject matter expert. However, psychology today says this. Homework is not simply to improve academic skills. Research finds that homework may have some academic, non-academic benefits as well, such as building responsibility, time management skills, and task persistence. There are benefits for kids to do that homework. Now, there is a certain amount of quality and quantity that optimizes the benefit, no doubt about it, but all said and done, supporting the children to do their homework and kids doing the homework is beneficial. And Paul says this, hey church, we have work to do. You have saved, but now you need to work out your salvation you're a citizen of heaven as you wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having said that, let's go back to the key passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, says Paul, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Lynn Kohik. Lynn Kohik is the distinguished professor of New Testament and the director of the Houston Theological Seminary. And she says this, and she's a brilliant commentator. She says this, God is not doing the good works for the Philippian believers as a parent might do a child's homework. Instead, God is making it possible for them to work by giving them access to the power to accomplish what he has asked. Parents give the child a good supper, a good a quiet place free of distractions, and encouraging comments about their previous good work. Thus, well fortified and encouraged, and with the proper tools and environment, the student can do his or her homework. What Lynn says is, God has designed that you and I work. Sometimes, he says the same thing that I found in the first word of the passage that I'm supposed to be able to present you from. Therefore, more work. Why? Because he wants us to grow. But why do we have to work? Philippians chapter 2, verse 15 says this. So that you may become blameless and pure, Children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe. God is a parent. He's your heavenly father. And even as he's given us this amazing salvation by his grace, he wants us to work so that in this generation in our world, he wants us to shine like stars stars in the universe. He wants us in his coming, in his second coming, for us to be able to be brilliant as stars in the universe. But notice this, the scripture also says, God is working in us. When God says, I want you to work out your salvation, this passage also says, God is at work in us as well. In other words, he gives us the resources that we require to work and live out the salvation 
that he has given us. Now let's pause here a bit. To some of us, there's a phrase in this passage that's absolutely disconcerting. Work out your salvation. That's a difficulty, and rightfully so. For Kohik, Lynn Kohik that I mentioned to you about, in her word, she says, the wordings, work out your salvation, registers, registers are 9.0 on the theological richer scale. It's a major earthquake to our understanding of the Christian faith. How do I bring work and salvation together in the same sentence? In fact, Scott Midnight says, Indeed, gluing the word work to salvation provokes a raised eyebrow or two for any Christian steeped in justification by faith and not by works. But then he encourages us. He says, lower your eyebrow because what Paul means is this. Saved people lived saved lives. Working out primarily means that we as saved people are obligated to live out saved lives. But before we can go any further, let me reassure some of our evangelical consciences that Ephesians chapter two verse eight does say, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's a gift, you have not worked for it. Not by works, says verse nine, so that no one can boast. I'd like to introduce you to a friend I have in, way back in India. His name is Rajkumar Ramachandran. Raj means king. Rajkumar means the son of a king. Now Raj was born in a Hindu family, he was a Brahmin, a deeply religious person. One day when he was working at Siemens, a small team of four, one of them, Nirmal, tells Raj this. He says, Raj, Jesus is the only way to God. Raj was very offended. And so he set out to prove that Christianity or his friend was wrong Use, and he said, I'm going to prove that my friend is wrong by using the Bible. Because when, for, for, uh, for Raj, every religion was equal. So he says, if Hinduism is as equal as Islamism, which is as equal as, as Christianity, he said, let me take the Christian book because all these holy books uh, should be equal. If all these religions are equal in my perspective, Raj thought, so let me take the Bible and use the Bible as a tool to prove to my colleague and this friend that Jesus is not the only way to God, that all religions are equal. So after studying the Bible in secret for over 14 months, he could not resist the love of Christ. He read the Bible, comes to John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, here's this verse which says, Jesus, is the, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And he came to become a Christian when he was 27 years old. And thereafter, he has traveled more than 40 years now, all over the world, sharing his faith and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been, I've, I've, I've worked very closely with Raj, and I've, I, I, I've witnessed his evangelistic efforts, the way that he gets to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what he does in India. And he, we invite uh, Christians, non-Christians, predominantly non-Christians for this gospel meeting. And so happens that Raj uses this format where he shares the good news about Jesus Christ, and then he opens up the floor towards the end for any question that could, people would like to pose to him. 
And Raj tells us that invariably, there is this question that's asked almost every time he says in his gospel approach. And the question that comes to him is, so Raj, are you saying based on what you're saying that uh, by doing works, we cannot be saved? Because I want you to understand that Hinduism, like several other worldviews and religious systems, is dependent on good works. You have to put a lot of effort into being pleasing to God and acceptable to him. So they tell Raj, Raj, based on what you're telling us, are you saying that Mother Teresa and Mahatma Gandhi, for all the good works that they have done, and because of all the good works that they have done, they cannot go to heaven? And Raj's response to them is this. He says, I do not know if Mother Teresa or Gandhi can or cannot go to heaven because of their good works. But he says, all that I know is this. Good people do not go to heaven. Only perfect people do. Good people do not go to heaven. Only perfect people go to heaven. And he turns their attention to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, where the Bible says, by this one sacrifice, and that one sacrifice is the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. By, this, by one sacrifice, he has made, God has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hallelujah. By this one sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has made each one of us who have accepted the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of God's word, we are being made holy holy. Raj, after struggling for 14 months with the scripture, studying it in secret, trying to prove to his Christian colleague that Jesus is not the only way to heaven or to God, he ultimately comes to this point of saying, my colleague is right. This love of this Jesus whom I read in the gospel is overwhelming. I just can not but respond. And in Munich, as an electrical engineer with Siemens in Germany, Raj walks up the aisle of the church one evening and commits his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says this. He says there are two questions that trouble me. I've struggled with God's word. I've accepted this Jesus Christ by walking down this aisle of a church and I, my life transformed. The joy that there is in my heart is so overwhelming. How can I be quiet? But there is these two questions I'm struggling with, Raj told himself, and the two questions are these. The first question is, when Jesus is the only savior from sins, for all mankind, how come no Christian ever told me that before except my friend Nirmal? And the second is, when this new life in Christ is so exciting and wonderful, how come the life of other Christians was no different from my life as a Hindu? How humbling is that? Now I want you to understand, Madras, Chennai, the place that I grew up in, where Raj grew up in, has so many Christians, so many church. If you don't trust what I'm saying, ask our friends, Jobai, and others who come from Chennai and that region, they will tell you that Christianity has so much of concentration in Chennai, the city or Madras where, where, where Raj and I grew up. 
And he says, how come except for Nirmal, when I was 26 years old, all these 26 years I've gone to Don Bosco, I've gone to Christian institutions, not one person told me about this Lord Jesus Christ. And the second question to us is, how is that the life of a typical Christian is not different from me as a Hindu? And in that context, I want you to start looking at what Paul told the Philippian church. My dear friends, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is working in you to act, to will, and to act according to his purpose. I'm going to summarize now. The passage talks about responsibility. You and I are saved by grace. And that grace, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is not a cheap grace. It costs the life of the Son of God to be humiliated on the cross. His blood was shed for us and for our salvation. But we are responsible to that free gift of salvation. We are responsible. And the word that Paul uses in this letter to the Philippian church is the word obedience. The word obedience. Paul says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, now much more, now continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What you and I need to do is to obey. You and I are responsible. Why? Because this Jesus, as Pastor Kurt said last week, this Jesus, though he was God, did not consider equality with God something that he should grasp, but he humbled himself. He emptied himself, but he humbled himself so that he could obey to the point of death and dying on the cross. The second thing that this passage talks about is not only responsibility, because I was thrilled 15 years ago when said, hey, responsibility has actually two words that is combined in it. You can break the word responsibility in two words. And what are they? The word is response plus ability, the ability to respond. Because when God says you need to obey and respond, he also says you have been given the ability to respond. How is that possible? Because Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is working in you to do according to his good purposes. So the second takeaway for us is resources. The first is, you and I are responsible. The second is that you and I have the resources that God has graciously given us in Christ Jesus. How I wish that there will not be another Raj in a lifetime who would stand up in a podium or ask himself after tasting the good uh, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, the salvation of God, the free gift of salvation that they will never have to say, how is that that I did not hear about the gospel? How wonderful it will be if the students on the campus right here, our neighbors in our communities around would say, I'm so glad that somebody came up to me and told me about this Lord Jesus Christ. And they will point to the Brentview Baptist Church and look at you and I as members of this congregation and say, hey, you know what? These are stars in the universe in this depraved and perverse generation. These people are different. These people are so different from what I've seen around. And they will want to taste the salvation for themselves. May I just take you through one quick exercise and then we're going to be through. Is that okay? Okay, in my part of the world, this is a yes and this is a no. Is that okay? 
Yeah, thank you so very much. Uh, of course, in India, right, we have a different gesture altogether. When uh, you ask a question and people, uh, when you have to say yes, you go like this. Uh, Rashka, you're right? Uh, there you go. <laughs> it's a very simple exercise, and then we're going to be through. I want, you to do, I want you to do all that I tell you to do. Is that a simple instruction? Is that okay? Did you get that? Now some of you are like getting worried. I can see you kind of uh, you know, shuffling in your seat. Um, I'm not going to ask you to pinch your neighbor's uh, cheeks. Uh, don't have to worry. This is going to be a very, very safe exercise. Are you with me? Do all that I tell you to do? Yes. Fantastic. One, well done. I want you to slip up your hand as high as you can. And I want you to wriggle your finger, and I want you to touch your forehead. Touch your nose, touch your forehead, touch your nose, touch your lips, touch your cheeks, touch your cheek. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. You may put down your hands. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the instruction, uh, the direction was very simple, right? Do all that I tell you to do. And you nodded your head, some in the Indian style. And uh, I said, lift up your hands. You did. So graciously, wriggle your fingers, touch your forehead, your nose, your lips. When I said, touch your cheeks, what did you do? Some of you did this. <laughs> you know, I did that too when somebody asked me to do that. Now, let me ask you this question. Why did you touch your chin when I asked you to touch your cheek? Oh, okay, because you did it. So you do something wrong and put the blame on me, eh? <laughs> no, it's just kidding. That, that, that's quite okay, right? In other words, what you're saying, Daniel, this is a very simple principle. Monkey see, monkey do. We saw you doing it, therefore, we got to imitate you. Very, very simple. Now, Brentview Baptist Church, people of God, the world is looking at you and they're looking at I. They're looking at us. And they want to see Jesus Christ in us. And if there are going to be new immigrants like Abby and little Elijah and Diana who are going to come here, more so because they are, and they're not from a Christian background, or uh, you know, international students like Rashika, who was not a Christian when she came to the campus, Declan, Declan was an influence. He, he somehow did, you know, reflect the, the Lord Jesus Christ that gravitated Rashika to the Lord Jesus Christ and she took baptism two, two months ago. How wonderful is that? You know what, the world is looking at you and I and I only hope that they will say, hey, I really wish that these people were different than what I am or what I've seen because the Lord Jesus Christ is in your life and in my life. And as they look at us, they start imitating us. They start reflecting us because there's something different within our lives and they'll know, oh, to be a Christian is this and I want this Lord Jesus Christ too. And may I encourage you like Paul encouraged the Philippian church that you and I will obey so that we can work out the salvation that Jesus is given us so freely and so graciously, as he constantly and continuously continue to work out his salvation in us so that we might will and act according to his good purpose. Maybe close our eyes and look to God in prayer. There's a beautiful song years ago that I learned which says, Lord, make me a sanctuary, pure and holy. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Can that be a prayer? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true 
with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you maybe stand up and sing the song just once again as a prayer before we hand this over to the worship team Lord help us Lord My battery ran out, I think. But even as we continue in this moment of consecration, a moment of committing our lives to Christ, let us sing this song once again. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary.